and thank you everybody for being here. I wasn't quite sure who'd turn up with all these multi-operating rooms. Um, yes, as Shelley said, Janet and I and our son Nick uh, run a, um, a beef cattle business. We, we breed, um, we've, we've just started actually a, a cattle breeding operation or enterprise, which is a, an F1 Wagyu breeding program. And in addition to that, we, we trade cattle, we buy and sell throughout the year. And there's reasons for that. Uh, just a little disclaimer, uh, this is not a get rich quick program or a pathway to overnight success. Um, and as you can see, there's a fair bit of work that goes into it. But what all I'll say is that, um, you know, it's our passion, I think, that draws us through the hard times. And it's our passion that allows us to enjoy the good times. And there are plenty of good times and there are also bad times. Um, just some summaries currently, we have a, uh, two, two blocks that are separated by about three, three kilometres. Uh, the first has uh, frontage, six kilometres of frontage to the McIntyre River, uh, single frontage from the New South Wales side, where New South Wales, I'm a New South Wales supporter, Janet has different ideas, but I'll swing her eventually. And, we, and the second block, which is about three kilometres away, uh, has 12 kilometres of single and double frontage to the Wayland Creek. Uh, we're based on the McIntyre floodplain, which is predominantly alluvial grey uh, loams and black vertisol soils. Excellent cropping and irrigation country. So <coughs> we have embarked on uh, uh, adopting regenerative agricultural principles. And I guess the obvious question is, why change? And for us, it's sort of summarised pretty well, I think, in this slide. <laughs> we, um, we found ourselves in a situation about 20-odd 20, 20 years ago uh, that we were um, involved in a, a conventional cropping, mixed cropping and grazing business. A lot of the uh, property infrastructure um, had deteriorated over time, which made uh, running our enterprises difficult. Uh, we weren't cropping enough country really to keep up with the inevitable uh, race of ever increasing capital expense on all the new technology, plus that really wasn't our passion. And in addition to that, we were faced with uh, family succession. Uh, I have three other siblings, none of whom are involved in the business. So we had a number of serious challenges in front of us and we pretty much felt like the fox. Um, I guess, as I suppose everyone can imagine, uh, the, the general way of dealing with these things when you go to the pub or when you go to a party or something, the, um, the conversation generally revolves around things like the weather, which we have absolutely no control over and which we're not responsible for. So we're all very comfortable talking about the weather. Um, don't knock the weather. If it didn't change once in a while, nine out of ten people couldn't start a conversation. <laughs> Quite true. But the fact of the matter is that in our landscape, we live in a land of drought and flooding rains. And that's just the reality of where we live. So, what to do? Um, and as uh, Shelley's already alluded to, we've effectively engaged ourselves in what has become a lifetime of learning. Um, whoop, wrong button there. Our first move was to uh, attend a grazing for profit school uh, run by a consultancy group, RCS, and we've continued a relationship with them over the last 20 something years. And they, uh, the learnings, I suppose, they, they gave us the grounding, I guess, to develop our vision for the property and for everything that we do after that. Uh, we, we did a KLR livestock marketing course. This became particularly uh, valuable to us because part of what we need to do, to be able to do, is to be very flexible. We need to be able to <coughs> increase and decrease our stocking rate in accordance with the carrying capacity of the land, which of course is going to vary depending on rainfall and floods and droughts. Uh, handling our livestock is a very important element. 
um, we've got to maximise the productivity of these animals and the last thing we need to be doing is, distressing, is stressing them. It's a, a very underrated and a very important thing to learn. We've done natural sequence farming training um, in recent times with a view, with a real focus on addressing some of the landscape issues that we have on the property, which uh, essentially we have a number of erosion gullies which have formed over time. Uh, we're right at the bottom of the sub catchment, which drains probably 60,000 acres of predominantly farming country, which invariably is completely bare. And um, so we get water, we get it quickly, and we get it in volume. We have to know how to deal with it. And recently we, uh, we attended an integrity soils workshop and we've continued to learn about, uh, about our soils, which are really the engine room of everything that happens on the place. So we developed a vision for the farm. This is our vision, that Malvera is a vibrant living landscape with a healthy, diverse and dynamic ecosystem. We have abundant and profitable agrarian enterprises that are in synchrony with the rhythms of nature. We explore the infinite possibilities of our beautiful landscape, allowing us to connect with and contribute to the natural order of life. And this pretty much hasn't changed over the last 10 or 12 years, and it guides every decision that we make on the place. A very good, um, there's been a lot of discussion about climate change and about the vectors that are contributing towards global warming. And I think Diana Rogers has hit the nail on the head. It's not the cow, it's the how. It's not the fact that we're running ruminant animals in our environment, it's the way we manage them as to whether or not we are contributing to the problem or solving it. So what have we done? The first thing that we did is a pretty ma massive uh, infrastructure upgrade. Um, we've subdivided our, our property into 82 paddocks with 28 water points. Just turned it off, Shelley. How do I turn it back on? There we go. Um, which involved, I think we put, it, put about 28 kilometres of um, 63 mill millimetre polypiping down, piping to about 28 water points right throughout the place and I don't know how many hundred kilometres of single hot wire electric fencing. The, these are the principles that we operate our business essentially. Uh, the grazing principles are to, are to plan, monitor and, and manage our activities and particularly, I mean the, the, the big three are the top three really. Give the plants adequate rest to recover after grazing and match our stocking rate to our available carrying capacity. Um, the regenerative ag principles, we were lucky enough to do a trip to the States in, in 2019 and we visited Gay Brown and I think these five agricultural principles or farming principles, if you want to put them in those terms, encapsulate what he's doing over there, which is to minimise the disturbance of the soil, keep the surface covered, keep the living roots in the soil for as much as you possibly can, grow a diverse range of crops or plant species, in our case, bring a, a, and, and effectively manage grazing animals on the land. And the, these KLR marketing principles are extremely important. So we're constantly um, evaluating our inventory of grass, money and livestock and essentially we have to balance each of those things. We, every day we sell and buy, so every day we get up in the morning and decide not to sell cattle, we've effectively bought them for another day. Every day. Know the price relationship, relationship between what we can sell and buy today, and there's, that's more or less a simple uh, cal calculation, but it's, it's attaching a value to you and what you do by way of providing yourself with a, a, um, uh, uh, an adjustment rate for, for your efforts on the land, which presumably will cover your overheads and all the direct costs associated with buying and selling those cattle. And then identifying which stock in the marketplace on the day is overpriced and which is underpriced. And that's the basis by which we determine what we sell and buy. And you have to have confidence that you're actually uh, going to do it. 
practice, people get paralyzed with analysis and never actually make a trade. Well, it's not a good way to make a profit. So just a bit of an example of what grazing management can do and particularly applying rest. Um, we've transfer, transformed our landscape and I guess uh, there are three elements to it. One is providing adequate walk, water for stock um, in our, to each and every one of our paddocks, uh, fencing the paddocks up and then ensuring that our grazing management uh, is managing for our pastures. Now uh, this is just a little example of moving stock. People get terrified with the notion of putting uh, cattle together into larger mobs and circulating those throughout the property and wonder how on earth you can possibly do it. Well, the reality is it's pretty simple. Once uh, the cattle get conditioned to regular moves, um, it helps with their temperament, but it also that, uh, makes it very, very easy to start movement in the mob and getting them move, moving th you know, into the next paddock. And this is what we like to see when we put them. So we've taken them out of this paddock, we've removed a certain amount of um, productivity from that paddock in the last graze. It's extremely wet there at the moment because it dry, uh, drains into that area. And, we've, um, and we like to see them fan out into, into the new paddock. Here I come, shut the gate. And that's what we like to see when they're grazing. Contented animals with their heads down, grazing. We've, we provide them with supplementation in the paddock, free choice supplements. Uh, that's a list of, of uh, what these um, steers are, uh, have access to. They have access to pretty much to all of that uh, right throughout the year and they select what they need and when they need it. And their consumption will vary according to the condition of the paddock, condition of the feed and so forth. We've also got um, what we call boss bags, which are these bags that are hanging from the end and it's got diatomaceous earth in there. Um, at this particular time, the um, buffalo fly were extremely bad and the cattle just love the idea of going over and dusting themselves, which helps them to you know, remediate the, the problems that they get with them. Okay. This is, so we do do a lot of record keeping and I was really interested in Lou's um, program and particularly the forecasting element. We don't have access to that data and we um, don't use it in quite the same way. I did throw this over to our technical department to develop this thing and he's a bit of an idiot, this guy, but this is the best he could do, me. Um, <laughs> so, so we're actually uh, collecting data which is the rolling 12 months of rainfall. So. Over here, in this case, coming into uh, 2018, our rolling rainfall was sitting at around 400 mils per, per year for the last 12 months. Our, our median rainfall allegedly is 600. <laughs> um, and as you can see, over the course of 2018 and 2019, it dropped to a low of just over 200. So we, we were roughly sitting on about a third of our median or an annual rainfall at the time. Um, this black line is actually the number of stock that we were running. Um, we, we sold out, I think in the 2017 year, we sold about 1,700 head of cattle off the place. And by uh, the beginning of uh, 2018, we, um, we were down to under 200 livestock units, which probably was about 150 head of cattle on the whole property on 6,000 acres. Um, we did get rain during the summer, oh, and it looks like probably in, in spring, which allowed us to lift our numbers a little, back to around 600 for a period of time. But we bottomed out in, uh, in November 2019, and we'll have some photos in a minute. Uh, we, I think we had about, well, about 50, 50 livestock units on the property, which is probably about 30 head. So our strategy, our drought strategy was basically to monitor our consumption and to vary our stocking rate as a result of the fact that we just didn't have any rain. Um, this, um, this number here is what we actually keep an eye on, and that is the number of stock days. So a stock day is one day of feed for, for one LSU, which is a 400 kilo steer at maintenance. 
We standardise everything back to an LSU, so we're monitoring the LSUs. So this is a calculation of this, the uh, number of stock days of feed for, a, for the previous 12 months per hectare, so divided by the number of hectares we have, divided by every 100 millimetres of rainfall. So in our case, uh, depending on what the rainfall was, we divide it by two or six or four or whatever it might be. So that gives us a bit of an early warning sign of when things are getting dry and we're starting to consume a fair amount of our feed. We set ourselves what is euphemistically called a benchmark, but every time I think about a benchmark, a bench you put your bum on, right? You sit on, no. This thing is a ceiling. This is our maximum, our maximum consumption rate that we're prepared to tolerate or that our country can handle which is 30 stock days per hectare per 100 mils of rain. And as we get closer to that, we know that we've got to start making some decisions about how we keep below that 30 stock days per hectare per 100 mils. So forecasting is a big part of that and decision making around reducing stock numbers. So as I said, I'll just draw your attention again to November 2019. Um, we do we have set up four monitoring points across the property where we, we do soil monitoring. And I, I just have to acknowledge Kim and Angus Deans from Reinventing Agriculture because they come and help us do, uh, do these where we, we set out a string line and we, we actually record all sorts of data around our soils in those locations at that time. We monitor things like um, water infiltration rates, uh, ground cover, um, species, composition and various soil characteristics that we can visually identify at the time and then periodically we, we take soil samples as well. And I'm taking a soil sample there and I'm very pleased to say that there were worms in there when I took that sample, so that was good. So here's just a few shots over, that, over the period since the 13th of May 2019 on those four sites and I'll whip through them very quickly. This is an old cropping paddock. We put a multi-species crop in in early 2019 because we had had some rain over the 2018-2019 summer. Uh, unfortunately, it stopped raining and by November. We'd consumed what we'd planted there in order to get stock to a, a tradable state and get them off the place. By uh, we thought, right, we've had rain in the 2019-2020 summer um, and we had applied the last of our broadacre spraying on the property at that time. We put Roundup over this paddock in preparation for establishing another multi-species crop and it didn't rain. Um, however, it did start raining eventually. <laughs> And the break for us came in, uh, in 2020. Uh, this, again, is another multi-species crop that we planted, uh, summer, <coughs> summer covers or summer, summer forage crop. And we included in that, um, in that particular crop one kilogram of Bambatsi panic seed. So we just started to introduce perennials into our multi-species crop at that time. By March of 2022, um, we had, uh, on this country, is actually in flooded country. Uh, we had, we've had three floods since 2021. We had one in March of 2021, one in uh, November of 2021, and then we had another uh, flood later on in 2022. But uh, this, this country did flood in addition to having uh, in excess of 600 mils of rainfall, we also had a flood over it. I'm not quite sure how I build that into my grazing chart, but anyway. Um, and you can see that we're starting to get uh, a lot of perennial establishment in that, uh, in that paddock. It, it's coming from a very low base, very low organic carbon levels, um, very high um, cal or, sorry, low calcium to magnesium ratio. So it's very tight. Um, it's, it needs a lot of TLC, but over time, we're starting to get the cover back into that paddock. Um, and that was taken in April of this year, very dry summer, 
uh, marsh rains, we're starting to see the perennials are really, are really kicking on in there. So there's a long way to go, but it's come a long way already. Uh, this is a, a paddock of native perennial grassland, Mitchell grass predominant, um, never been farmed, same sort of thing, November, shocker. Uh, and then we're starting to see recruitment of, or re-establishment, I suppose, of the perennial grasses and forbs through here, and a gradual progression. And then after a very dry summer, um, a lot of, uh, well, this, this, this would be um, spring grass that's coming through, but uh, a lot of perennial grass is re-establishing again. Um, old cropping country, this goes back to, it was, it's been abused for a long time, been farmed since the 50s, it was irrigated in the 60s, it was farmed in right up until about 2005. We let it naturally re-establish to native perennials over the, uh, since that time, November was dreadful, uh, a bit of rain and, and then dry, and then slowly the perennials are starting to establish in there. And what we're seeing is, we're starting to see high succession perennial grasses coming through this country that we didn't know grew here. Mitchell grass is coming back in through here. There's a lot of Queensland blue grass, There's quite a number of other, other grasses and other species coming as well. And there it is today. Um, it's very exciting to see what's going on here. Still very bad infiltration rates, still structural issues, but the, the intention is that deep-rooted perennials are going to go a long way to solving that problem. But it all takes time. And this one is a paddock in our low river country. Um, November 2019 was terrible. The buffalo grass became a monoculture, um, but with ex succession of rainfall events, we're starting to see some of these other species may not be desirable for grazing, but they're all doing, doing something for us. They're very deep rooted, um, uh, including flea bane, the bane of farmers. Mm -hmm. We quite like it because it's got a very, very tough and very extensive taproot. And in April, um, we started to see, believe it or not, some diversity coming through that paddock. So things are happening. Uh, the multi-species forage crops have been really important for that successional process, possibly more so than providing us with productive feed, but it certainly has provided us with productive feed. Uh, this is an example of a summer mix that we planted dry and then subsequently got the rainfall. And then over here, similar thing, planted a winter um, mix with oats and, and vetch and various uh, several different um, species of, um, of winter active lucerne, um, desmanthus, which is a summer perennial legume, which we're very keen to establish right across the place. And we're starting to see um, uh, native perennial grass recruitment through these paddocks. <coughs> Another example of that down on our river country with vetch and, and um, oats pred predominating. Pasture cropping, we, we had a visit from Cole Sice and Christine Jones in 2007 and we have been trialling, I suppose, or uh, opportunity pasture cropping from time to time. This is just a photo of, of a pretty good oats establishment through a buffalo grass paddock actually. And I think it's really contributing towards successional change in that paddock over time. That's another example, and a fence line effect with uh, some crown land that um, we've just taken possession of. We're leasing that land and trying to regenerate it. We're not getting any productivity out. It's called Richard's Folly, that one. We just, we just, it was bare ground about five years ago, and now it's got something growing on it, which is pretty exciting. Um, We've been very, very fortunate to be involved in several different environmental stewardship pro projects, one with the uh, Federal Department, which started about 11 years ago, and the other with uh, the Biodiversity Conservation Trust of New South Wales. Both of these um, projects are based on um, stewardship of an endangered ecological community, which is our uh, floodplain grasslands of the northern region now. I don't think any, anyone would care to guess why they're endangered, <laughs> because the vast majority of them have been ploughed up and planted to crops over the last 30 or 40 years. So 
We've probably done a Stephen Bradbury on this one. I think we were the last man standing with decent stands of, of um, native perennial grasses, so we, we won gold there. And these, these projects have been really important for us because um, it's, it's quite an expensive process to go through to set yourself up and, and manage for, um, for the ecological health of your, of your landscape when your landscape has been uh, eroded. And probably the, la the biggest cost of all is time because it's going to take time to remediate these places back to a point where they're as productive as we would like to see them. Uh, these little guys, after the floods of 2021, uh, we were doing our monitoring pro, uh, pr process um, and every hoof print in the paddock had about three or four of these guys. We did, uh, we did some bird counts back in uh, January of 2020 when it was still very dry and in two hours um, identified 63 bird species across the place. The majority of them were on the river and they were, the majority of them were water bird species. Uh, and the reality, as soon as it rained, we went back and did a second count. We didn't get anywhere near the numbers because their preference is to be out in shallow, warm water, um, wading and doing whatever water birds do. And, but uh, we had provided habitat for them in a particularly difficult period, so that was really encouraging. And then those little guys, uh, you know, as an indicator of ecological health, that's... That's what, we've, that's what we lived with for about four weeks or six weeks or however long it was for that water to, um, to, to reside, so to, to uh, sort of work its way through the system. So that was encouraging. Uh, we've also signed up to a carbon project uh, last year. And as you can, Janet insists on pointing out that we're 0007, <laughs> licensed to sequester. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, it's a really, it's important for us. We've chosen to do this. Um, we appreciate that there are risks around these projects in that we've still got to, uh, you know, it's a, there's a degree of uncertainty until such times as we know how our carbon's trending. We have every confidence that we're managing for carbon um, and carbon will be a byproduct of what we are doing. And as I said before, it's important to us to ensure that we've got the capital that we need to continue doing the work that we want to do. This is one source, one very rare source of capital finding its way back from the cities back into the landscape. And there just aren't enough of them in my view. So we put 169, took 169 four samples across the property um, and they've been divided up into three different lo locational areas and that and, the, and the, the division in the case of the river country is that it's a different soil type it's more of a lo loamy soil up there and the difference between this area and this area is that this area is predominated by um, country that we have under stewardship agreements and we're restricted in uh, what activities we can conduct to um, demonstrate additionality in the project there. So in that area there, our intention is to continue with subdivision and, uh, um, and increase the number of water points in that area so that we've got better grazing management control. In this area down here, um, there's quite a lot of old cropping country and we'll continue to try and establish um, uh, native perennials, which will uh, sort of uh, help with that process. Here's uh, very quickly, that's the carbon stock that was identified in the top 30 centimetres of soil. I'm, I'm sorry I'm rushing this. That's the carbon stock in um, the rest of it to a depth of a metre. Um, and interestingly, all those old farming areas are the ones that are lacking carbon. Surprise, surprise. Uh, we also host fields days and, and field trips. This was uh, a day that was organised by McIntyre Ag Alliance uh, based in Gundawindi and was supported by uh, Landcare and Northern Slopes Landcare and uh, via the Green Triangle Group of which we are members. 
uh, and we had we were lucky enough to have Joel Williams as a guest speaker, courtesy of, of Northern Slopes. Um, it was a wonderful day. There were 100 people attended that. Um, we're involved in various different support groups. Our Green Triangle farmers, we're a member of those. Lots of like-minded people doing similar things. These are some of the projects we've done, just inspecting some of our grazing country there. And we had a day not long ago um, where we all brought soil samples in and looked at them. This is an RCS group that uh, are doing a training program in Gundawindi that they were brought out to our place and we discussed what we were doing there. Um, I've really got to acknowledge Shelley, who's our coordinator for Green Triangle. Um, we really value that group environment, particularly Green Triangle, because we're just uh, we're learning together and we're learning from each other, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, that is a good one. So why? Why are we doing what we're doing? I think I've explained that. We have a very strong vision for our property. Why not? Why not that? I mean, I can't. I can as opposed to that, which is over the fence. Well, that's how much the market values that country right now. That's how much the market values that country right now. Right now, it's cost us in the order of $7 million to be doing what we're doing, if you prescribe to, subscribe to that sort of thinking. So that's a real barrier that has to be overcome in some way. Here's the why. I think this is a wonderful um, quotation. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And I think if people get that, then they're committed for life. Thank you. <laughs> Any quick questions? Yes. You said you had 160 people samples. Was that part of working out carbon to your part? So part of the, the carbon project is that uh, the first thing you do is to establish a, a benchmark. So they come in and do baselining. So they've come and taken all those core samples and they've established how much carbon we've got in the landscape right now. And then in five years time, they'll come back and they'll do another test and they'll establish how much carbon we have in the landscape at that time. And the difference obviously between the two is the amount of carbon that we've sequestered. Is that expensive to build that many schools? It is, yes. It's cost us about $60,000 to benchmark the property. Um, so again, that's one of the risks that people have to consider when they um, enter into a, a something like this. Now we're not obliged to send, sell any of our carbon, but equally uh, part of the accounting process when they determine how much net carbon we've sequestered is to account for all of our emissions on the place over that period of time. So we're, we're, we're then left with a net amount and then it's our choice as to whether or not we, um, and that's after we've um, paid the, the, the acute or the project manager who take a portion of those ACUs and then it's up to us how we choose to manage those ACUs after that time, whether we choose to sell them or to retain them or whatever we might like to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Richard, that was great. Um, two questions. You mentioned uh, early on, I think it was the Gilgai paddock or the Gilgai soils, that there were still some soil constraints there that you hadn't, and I was just wondering what they were. And secondly, how did you um, ensure additionality when you started your carbon project, given that you were already doing some of these practices? Yep, so uh, the first question, yeah, the Gilgai paddock, it's a cracker. Um, so uh, the, 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 the key constraints, the physical constraints pr principally, I mean, very relatively low organic carbon. As I said, um, you know, calcium magnesium ratio is low, um, lots of magnesium. So it's a very hard setting soil. The infiltration rates are have been low and are slowly increasing, which is really encouraging. So there's, which is an indicator that there's some biological, some biological activity there that we're obviously looking to promote. Um, they're the major issues and you, the, the nutrition for, for, for crops and so on. So it's relatively low in, in nitrogen, but that's not a major issue for us uh, with the species that we're looking to promote. Um, the additionality, uh, our major um, additionality elements are going to be further intensification of, of grazing through subdivision and, and additional water 
um, allowing us um, to more effectively manage cattle through the landscape and the um, establishment of native perennial legumes, or sorry, of perennial legumes in particularly through uh, the old cropping areas. Uh, we're restricted as to what we can do on the, the land that we manage for conservation right at the minute. Yep. Yes, that's, well, the, the desmanthus, I mean, we've, we have established um, lucerne as part of a mix. Um, we live on a floodplain and the floods have been a bit of an issue for us. Uh, we lost a lot of what we planted um, in the last couple of floods because they, you know, we've got country that can be underwater for several weeks. Any, any, the, the river country, believe it or not, is, it drains relatively quickly and those species uh, persist. But um, if they're sitting or standing in water for a long period of time, we've got an issue. So we'll re-establish and we'll just see how we go. I, I, I ha hold hopes for Desmanthus because it does develop into quite a shrub. And I think with a bit more structure and a bit more time, it might be a bit more resilient. We'll just have to wait and see. Work in progress, that one. I don't know quite what the solution is there. 